is a Dr. Um, Nicandro Figueredo, and he's a medical school resident in neurosurgery in, in, and master degree and PhD in neurosurgery in Brazil, fellowship in spine surgery in John Hopkins University, was from uh, Hospital USA, was uh, postdoctoral follow-up in spine surgery in University of Washington in Hospital United States, visiting professor of okay. neurosurgery Brazil, and academic editor is spine surgery of Journal of Medicine USA. Currently is working is a spinal um, as a spine surgeon in Medical Orthopedic Hospital in Dubai. And Fadlan and um, he's uh, he's starting the lecture now. Please can you switch off your um, TV and stop talking the, the the people behind you. And Dr. Nicandro, welcome. And uh, the session. The question and answer. Anyone can unmute this microphone and can ask any question you want it. Uh, yeah. good, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, thanks, Dr. Farah, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm very grateful for the audience. Uh, the university in Somalia is a, a special uh, uh, present, uh, presentation for them. I also invite some colleagues here, university here in UAE and uh, in Brazil as well. So everybody is very welcome. And uh, Dr. Farah already introduced me. I'm a spinal neurosurgeon, but also I'm a professor. Uh, uh, sorry? C can you hear? Yes, you okay. can Okay, so uh, the, the topic today is, is about evidence-based medicine. For, hello? Hello? Okay, uh, the, top, the top today is about evidence-based medicine for the management of spinal disorders. How to use the evidence-based medicine for the, on the clinical practice? <laughs> Um, uh, a bit. Okay, so uh, the point is, the, the objective of this lecture is not to teach about the spinal surgery, of course not, but the main goal is to discuss about the, the principles of evidence-based medicine, use an example uh, for the spinal care, which is my specialty. So I'll give some different examples, different uh, approach for using uh, EBM on the clinical practice. So, as we know, evidence-based medicine is a very old concept. More than 2,000 years ago, Socrates and enthusiastic were discussing about it, and they were even surprised how come not all the doctors were using ABM on that time. Imagine, more than two years back. Uh, but we know that this concept came back to the uh, medical field more than 20 years ago with the uh, publication of Sackett and his studies in Oxford University where he, uh, the concept, the new concept of EBM is the conscious, explicit, and judicious use of the best available evidence to help the physician to uh, have the, make the best decision as possible for the treatment of your patient. So give some uh, mathematical estimates, which can help a lot to, to deal with the, the different possibilities, what to do and uh, what's the, the risk and benefit for each kind of technique or medication or different uh, uh, intervention that you can perform to best treat your patients. So this is one of the publications of Sackett about this tripod of EBM, which is the use of the, your clinical expertise, your, your own knowledge, the best available evidence, and of course, the patient values. Uh, one of the pioneers of the popularization of EBM in neurosurgery in the U.S. was my mentor of my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Resnick from Wisconsin. He published many papers and presented many lectures about the use of EBM in neurosurgery. One of the very nice uh, papers that he presented, he published more than uh, in 2007, was to give the basic concept how to use the EBM for the uh, regular clinical questions. So basically, according to the availability of the evidence, you can uh, tell the patient or the family that that procedure is only a good guess or not even that. So there is the, the chance of having uh, that procedure as the best procedure for that current situation, it varies according to the availability of the, uh, according to the level of the evidence. So just some examples. 
it's quite obvious this case is a patient with uh, polytrauma who came to an emergency hospital in my place in Brazil. And he was uh, diagnosed with this big intra cerebral hematoma with midline shift and the intracranial pressure was very high. So a very clear indication for surgical decompression, removal of the hematoma, those are my colleagues in Brazil, uh, a large craniotomy, opening of the dura mater and uh, hematoma removal for the, uh, for the best management of the patient. Okay, it's a very obvious situation. Uh, therefore, there is no strong evidence to support this hematoma evacuation. So it seems to be very, very strange, isn't it? So that's the point. There's some situation in the clinical practice in which you don't have a very good evidence, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. That's why the basis, the basis of EBM is this tripod, your clinical expertise, your, your judgment, the literature, and the patient values. So in such cases, of course, it's not ethical to treat a group of patients which clearly need one hematoma uh, evacuation and decompression on the conservative matter, on the conservative uh, group. So it's because of ethical reasons, sometimes you're never going to have a very good evidence for some uh, question that you have in the medical field. Another typical example, uh, the case of the parachutes. For example, there is no strong evidence in proof that use of parachutes uh, for the skydiver jump from the airplane, it's uh, the best thing. Of course, it's, it's mandatory, but no, there is no control group to, uh, of skydivers to jump from the aircraft without parachutes. So just, of course, one uh, a very uh, weird example just to, to show that sometimes not having the best evidence doesn't mean that that approach or that medicine, that intervention not useful. That's why I have to use all these three concepts. So again, the EBM is based on, on your expertise, your knowledge, the best available evidence on the literature and the patient values. For example, on patient with disc, lumbar disc herniation, it is very important to know which pain he's going to get rid of, the back pain, which is more difficult with any surgical approach, or the leg or sciatic pain, which is much more uh, easy to remove surgically, for example. So according to the patient expect, uh, expectancy, is, is what he really expects from that specific treatment is also important to assess the evidence and give the best uh, treatment for him. So just to uh, emphasize the, the basic concepts of EBM, in this case, I'm using the, the classification of North American Spinal Society, NAS, one the biggest spine organization in the world, which classified the evidence from level one, the strongest one, to level five, the weakest one. So when, when you say that there is no evidence, is not a good way to to say to or to, to express yourself, because there is always some evidence. The, the point is there is strong evidence or weak evidence. You have to try to remember these uh, principles. For example, what is a strong evidence? Especially studies, comparative studies, level one, two, and three. What's a level one study uh, according to NES? Those randomized controlled trials, for example, RCTs, we randomize the patients and has a control group so those are the best uh, uh, surgical procedures in general. Or systematic reviews of such studies. Uh, what's the level two? Level two is also comparative, but not randomized study. Those prospective comparative studies are usually considered level two of evidence. Level three are also comparative, but retrospective uh, series. So you compare group, but on, on a retrospective matter. So it's level three of evidence, not that strong. K level four is based on case series. Okay, is that weak evidence? Yes, it is. But it's very useful, especially for new procedures, new medicine, new techniques, where you, don't, you want to know basically if the procedure is safe and effective, and then you can uh, spread this, this, uh, this knowledge, you can publish this paper, and the other uh, groups can collect more patients to give a stronger evidence. It's, usually, it's very useful for new techniques. And the level five, it's what I think it is. I remember when I was a young neurosurgeon some time ago, uh, when I went to my place, one colleague of mine said, Anik, ah, for anything in neurosurgery, there's always some paper saying 
one thing and other patient another patient say the opposite thing so yeah that was uh, a kind of misinterpretation but it was not completely wrong actually so what happens uh, it's true the publication show anything you want basically the point is not only having publication but you have to see to assess the level of evidence how strong how powerful is that uh, a statement based on the level of the evidence of the publication which are supporting that specific intervention or a new medicine or whatever in the medical field. So that's a very old, old style saying, oh no, I do different because I came from different school. No, I don't agree with this kind of argument anymore. You have literature, any school in the world can be here in Somalia, in Brazil, in US, the patient have basically similar disease. The medical books are almost the same, if not the same. So the knowledge is the same. The disease are basically uh, very similar everywhere. So the evidence has to be following these principles. So uh, in summary, the level one of evidence is those studies which are randomized, controlled studies, so prospective studies, the best evidence uh, available. Level two, are those prospective but comparative studies. Level three, retrospect comparative studies. All these three are comparative one. Level four, case series, you publish your first series of 20 patients if you're using a specific uh, medicine. And level five is uh, your opinion, what you think or what your professor who is a very good doctor, what he thinks is the best uh, treatment for one specific uh, disease. So that, that is some value, but not so strong if not supported for, by another level of evidence. Based on the level of, of evidence of the articles, the articles give the level of evidence, and based on that, you can give the recommendation grade from A to C. So what's the recommendation grade you A? When you have um, multiple studies, level one, so RCT studies, supporting that specific intervention, for example, so that's this, that uh, intervention, has a very good recommendation. Recommendation A is a recommended intervention for a specific disease, okay? When there is uh, only a single level one study or multiple level two or three studies, so not that strong, is also has a good evidence, it's considered fair evidence or a recommendation B as a suggested procedure for that specific treatment. When there is, on, there is no level one, but single level two or multiple level four or five, like case series, then the evidence is not that strong, so it can give recommendation C or it's an option. Those situations are the best one that you have to stop before you go forward, bring the family, discuss openly with the patient. Well, uh, Mr. or Mrs., I believe this is the best treatment for your case, although there are not so many studies proving it, but you need a treatment. So uh, I, I'm suggesting this treatment as seems to be a good one, but still, we don't have enough evidence, but that's an option for the treatment of your case. So you have to be very frank with the patient on those cases, especially. And less than that, you don't have uh, enough evidence to support in favor or against one specific procedure or medicine, for example. So I uh, usually, uh, most of my uh, uh, reports here, I'm using those uh, guidelines from North American Spine Society, NAS, CNS and WNES, the most, the strongest uh, society in regard to spine surgery. For example, another uh, very nice way to deal with uh, some pathologies, it can be regional, can be your university, your uh, medical society, is to uh, write guidelines. Guidelines are very good for publication, they're very good to guide on specific treatment in your region, in your hospital, or in your society, for example. So how to build guidelines, just some uh, general uh, uh, ideas. So basically you identify what the question, what's the best treatment for cervical disc herniation, for example. And then you choose your, your work group if possible. For example, for in spine, the spinal surgeon, the radiologist, the physiotherapist, for example, all together to represent different approach for cervical disc herniation. After that, you choose the, the search term, which are important for your, your question. You make the literature search, 
identify the papers uh, based on the uh, titles and abstracts, review all the abstract that you, it's, it's uh, fitting with your question, which are included on the paper, and then you, you analyze. If there is papers level one, two, and three, so comparative studies, no need to, to include your re review, uh, other papers level four or five. So if there is comparative study, you can exclude others and include only those papers for your systematic review, for a meta-analysis of your guideline that you're willing to write. Then you analyze the evidence of those papers which are going to be included. It's very important to graduate the papers. Uh, as Dr. Farah said, I'm the editor of the journal Medicine in the section of Spine, academic editor. So uh, I'm trying to, to push the author when they send the papers to us to be published, to always classify the evidence of the, their own paper. Of course, we also we double check, but if the author can classify the evidence, it's very important for us and for his reading to, to be clear even on the uh, abstract of the paper was the evidence level and recommendation grade. After that, uh, you can formulate the, the recommendation based on the level of evidence of the paper that you collected. In some situations, or for example, regarding this creation, there are different subtopics about the diagnosis, about the, the clinical examination, surgical technique, and so on. For example, suppose that for the clinical examination, there are not so many papers showing which neurological test is more important. For example, for the Hoffman test for cervical myelopathy. Okay, there are not many studies showing uh, the, the importance of this neurological test. They are more for surgery or for medicine, for example. And then, but it is important to know if this neurological test should be used or not, or what's the importance of the test. In this case, uh, you, you can, if it's an important question, and if there is no strong evidence, there is no, not many papers describe that sub-item of your uh, main question. So you can do what we call expert consensus. Basically, you join, you, you join the group, of uh, authors of your paper or of your review, systematic review, for example. And uh, well, what do you think is the importance of a Hoffman test for patients with cervical myelopathy to test this reflex on the finger? Well, so I think this test is very important. I give uh, from one to nine, I think the importance is seven. Another colleague, the physiotherapist, well, I believe the importance is eight. Another, uh, the clinician from my group, well, I believe the importance is nine, okay? So more than 80% of the group ranked seven or above as a Hoffman test is important for cervical myelopathy for the clinical diagnosis. Just one example. In this case, okay, so there is no papers responding properly about the importance of this test, but on your systematic review, you, uh, when you think that one question is very important and they don't have evidence and you don't have enough paper, you can just explain and then you put like a consensus of the group is that Hoffman is important uh, for the majority of the, of the colleagues. And then you submit the paper for the final review of your group or of your institution, approval, and finally, you submit for the publication on the uh, journal that you wish to. When there's a paper from a strong medical society, some important guidelines, for example, not only a systematic review, but the guidelines, it's very important to keep it uh, refreshing every three to four years to review if, uh, the evidence about the same question to see, to give the, a, a more, a more, a more uh, accurate and updated information for your, uh, the member of your society. I'd like to highlight about these uh, guidelines because it's very useful to write papers, systematic reviews. When the student and resident, they want to write papers, very, uh, quite often, if you don't have enough uh, patients with that specific pathology, for example, to have a, a powerful uh, uh, sample, you can use a, system, a systematic review on, based on those concepts, just uh, as example. So, I'm just going to highlight, as I said before, a few situations in which we can use the EBM for different uh, uh, objectives. This case was the, the paper of my postdoctoral fellow. 
Uh, I went to Wisconsin. I was uh, under supervision of Dr. Daniel Resnick there, who is one of the, as I said, one of the fathers of uh, IBM in neurosurgery in the US. And we decided that we should study the, the management of the treatment of patients with intraspinal pendymoma. Intraspinal pendymoma is, is a relatively rare spinal tumor. That's why I decided to study it, because there are not many uh, papers with good number of patients to tell us which technique, which approach is better to deal with this disease. That was our objective. So uh, the rationale was to study intraspinal pendymum, study also the case in Wisconsin University Hospital, and also on the literature. And uh, was not surprised that there are not so many papers about this uh, disease. We decided to study only, uh, we decided to include only papers in English, uh, published in the last 10 years to reflect the most uh, recent uh, techniques. So we performed this review of the literature and also of the case of Wisconsin University, but this is a systematic review. So at the end, we found only 27 clinical papers about intraspinal pendymomas. All papers class four, meaning only case series, no comparative study about the pendymomas. And the reason is very simple. They're, they're, most of the hostel and, and, and colleagues didn't have so many patients to have enough number for comparison. That's why in this case, systematic review is very important because you can collect much more patients doing this kind of uh, revision. So we could collect uh, 1,200 patients. Uh, their age was about, uh, a, bit, a bit less than 40 years old, average age. And we decided to separate mixed papillary pneumoma, which has a different uh, uh, pathology, in the, especially in the caldequina region, of intramedullary pneumoma. Just to focus on what we found, what was very interesting during this systematic review. First of all, there's only five papers, clinical papers about mixed papillary pneumoma in the last 10 years. It was a very surprise for me, not too many papers about it. Only 200 patients uh, could be included because there are not so many uh, 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 articles about it. So based on this available literature, we came to a very, very, very important conclusion, which was new on that time. Uh, we published this in 2013. We know that mixed papillary pneumoma is a benign spinal tumor. Despite of that, the recurrence rate is relatively high. Like one of each four patients have recurrence after the treatment, after surgery. Well, that's not so benign as we thought before, but even though it was not surprised, you know that the recurrence rate is relatively high, especially with drop metastasis inside this, uh, the, dural tick, the dural sac, like drop metastasis. Anyway, but the really surprising thing that we have to read again when, when we found out this result was that the ideal treatment for, uh, in general, for benign spinal tumors is the total removal of the tumor. It's called gross total resection. Okay, when the patient submits, for, uh, on the group of the patients submitted to total resection of the tumor, meaning you cannot see any other tumor on the intraoperative view by microscope, neither uh, on the MRI in the first one month, so there is no sign of any uh, remaining tumor after surgery. 15% of those cases, they had recurrence of the tumor. Wow. More surprising was that some authors suspect, uh, uh, well, uh, a very word about this high incidence of recurrence. They decide to add radiotherapy, even is a benign tumor, and even after total removal. And what was very important that the, the chance of recurrence, it was really new information for us, dropped to almost one third of the chance. So the, uh, it really, to start to change the treatment protocol for mixed papillary pneumoma, which was the first systematic review which was showing these results. So uh, in summary about this systematic review about uh, spinal pneumoma, but all the studies were level four, so only uh, cases series, and uh, we could 
approve or at least suggest uh, or at least consider an option based on the evidence level that the routine use of uh, radiotherapy after any removal of mixed papillary tumor, even total removal, is really a very good option because since that can reduce a lot the chance of recurrence. So there is evidence level four uh, support this statement. As evidence level four, we have recommendation grade C, so it's considered an option. The, the routine use of postoperative radiotherapy after any surgery for uh, mixed papillary pneumoma, even after total removal. Because before uh, this guideline that we published on the systematic review, uh, after total removal, most of the time, the only follow up. But after that, we suggest that the, should be used the routine radiotherapy. But of course, we need uh, more papers about the same topic to see if we can have comparative studies or uh, larger systematic review to confirm or to refute this uh, statement. One year ahead, one uh, very good center in the US also published a very similar study. So this was our publication, 2013, about the systematic review. And these are the case series that we study in the same uh, place in Wisconsin University. 38 patients with mixed popularity minimum. This one, a book chapter published about the same technique, the same uh, talk. And uh, two, three years later, uh, I came to Dubai, I moved to Dubai, and I saw this Emirati girl, 11 years old, which came to us with paraparesis a few months before, some back pain, a bit unusual on her age, actually nothing uh, relevant. And uh, we did an urgent MRI, which showed this very large interspinal tumor, typical image of mixed papillary pneumoma. Well, uh, it was very, uh, I mean, very, uh, very interesting case, of course. We prepared for the surgery. We explained to the family the chance it was, uh, that it was mixed papillary pneumonia was very high. And based on our study, I was happy to say that we would go for surgery after confirmation of this uh, diagnosis. Uh, we, we tried to remove as much tumor as possible, if, if uh, feasible, the whole tumor. And conf if it was MPE, so we would go for radiotherapy despite the removal, if we could remove the total one based on the available literature. The family was happy initially, but suddenly they decided to, to go abroad. Okay, uh, patient choice, no, no problem. But two years later, this girl came back to my clinic. I, was, I didn't hear from her for a long time. Uh, with a report from abroad, she, was to, she went to a hospital in Europe where they removed the tumor not completely, probably was subtotal removal of the tumor. And uh, I cleared, asked them, I checked out the report, the kids were not sent for radiotherapy. So when she came with the same symptoms as before, immediately we suspect what was happening, it was recurrence of the tumor and it was confirmed with multiple uh, drop metastases inside her uh, dural sac. In this case, I, I, I discussed the family and uh, I suggested them to go back to the same center where she was operating initially. Another situation, another example, if there is any question about this first case, please feel free. Uh, as you like, so any question now is fine or at the end, please feel free. Another, another example, how we can use the EBM for the, also for the daily basis uh, situation. This uh, was a very difficult and rare case that came to me in which in order to, to try to convince the insurance doctor to approve the surgery, we decided to also make a publication about the same case. This uh, young Egyptian girl came to me with severe scoliosis being, uh, uh, remember, she had only three years old. For who deals with spine is really a nightmare because it's too young to have any spinal fusion and the scoliosis on this level, six degrees of scoliosis, has a very high chance of uh, worsening in a very quick manner. So uh, early onset scoliosis has a very uh, unpleasant uh, natural history, and this is considered severe scoliosis and need surgery. Because you cannot make fusion as you don't allow the lung to grow and you cause very uh, horrible damage to the lungs, also a severe deformation, shortening of the trunk and so on. So surgery for fusion is not recommended. The traditional technique 
was use of traditional growing rods. So basically you open the, the spine on the top and the bottom, put rods below the skin, and every six months we open again and we just uh, adjust the rods to grow with the child. So after three, after three years or so, we change the rods again and so on. But every six months that you open the kids and make one adjustment to allow the kids to, to grow. It, it's, that's a standard, that was a standard technique in that time, but it was a bit, uh, of course, it's very uh, complicated situation. You have to do many surgeries, high risk of infection and complications. So, but on that time, I, I never seen before, but I knew that it was a new technique. Basically, you, the same, very similar to the, to the traditional growing rods, but instead of opening the child every six months to, to adjust the rod to grow, they developed a new uh, magnetic rod, which you can put the, the magnet on the, on the top of the skin, and you decide how many millimeters you want to allow the rod to grow, and immediately the, the rod extends. So very nice technique, but very, very new. This is the magnetic rod and the, the magnetum. So basically the same technique, you put, make incision on the top and the bottom. And this, instead of the regular rod that you have to open and make the adjustment, this has a magnetic part which can adjust on the top of the skin on your, on your clinic. But when we requested the surgery for, to the insurance, they said, no, there is no, uh, what's the evidence for that? Well, I collect a few papers, I sent to the doctor, and uh, the approval came after five or six months, basically. At the same time, we decided to do a systematic review about the use of growing rods, especially when you, uh, we found out there's, there was, on that time, only six clinical papers about magnetic rods uh, on that time, 2014, when we started this study. This magnetic rods was uh, developed by Aki Barney and his colleagues. This, so this is very important to show how we do the systematic review. Basically, I like to do systematic review using two different tables. First, this is called a descriptive summary table in which I include every uh, single paper which are going to be included on this review with uh, classification of the level of evidence a uh, short description of the case and some comments, which you're going to analyze uh, all together on the next table, which is the quantitative one. This is still the descriptive uh, table showing all the six papers about uh, magnetic rods. Well, collect those in the, the information of those uh, six papers. I put on that table, you make it easy to analyze and then I transfer the, the average or the, or the numbers of the table to the quantitative table. So and this part two of the systematic review is a very important uh, uh, tricks because you can use it anywhere in the world. You can do systematic review of different things that you need in medicine, any specialty. So for example, on this summary table, there are six papers included addressing uh, that topic, only six papers in the literature. But because of this six paper, could collect 68 patients. It can give a bit more power to the conclusion that you're going to get. We could conclude it because uh, many things about these magnetic rods were not clear. How, uh, what's the interval to bring the kids to the, to the clinic to make the, the, the adjustment to, to extend the rods? Those papers are showing that around two months was the average for this uh, extension. And every time the kids come to the office, you adjust around three millimeters. That was the conclusion of this systematic review. And also uh, it gives a very good correction and extension of the spine, increase the length, being even much better on uh, using the double rods instead of on a single rod on the spine, even for correction of the scoliosis itself and also for the uh, lengthening of the spine very similar uh, complication rates, which was also something a bit uh, doubtful at the time, which one is better, double rod or single rod in terms of risk of complication and benefits. So this is the search that we did in this child. We opened the top and bottom and the general anesthesia using interoperative neuromonitoring. And then we set the rods below the skin and the muscles. And uh, we fixed the rods for fusion on the top and bottom with bone graft, but all the center was free. 
and uh, the magnetic portion of the rods was here. And then you could adjust one side each without interference. So basically, immediately after surgery, the scoliosis dropped from six to 28 degrees with these rods, which would be the same with the traditional growing rods. The adventure was that two months later, she came to my clinic. The scoliosis was getting worse again. Immediately in the clinic, we put the, the magnetum on the back of the kid and the spine extend again, the, the rod uh, expansion allowed the, the correction of scoliosis again. So it could be done on a regular basis every two months or as needed without uh, having the necessity to open the child's back again. So on this paper, also because of a lack of available literature, it could uh, give a level four of evidence showing that magnetic rod was a safe and effective uh, surgical technique. Uh, given level two of evidence, you see in the same paper, we can give different levels of evidence for different conclusion. That's another important aspect that can highlight in this paper. Regarding the use of the magnetic rods, level four, showing that it's safe and effective. But when you, because on those papers, there are comparison of double and single rods, you could give level two of evidence because the comparison was on this, the single paper, but on this uh, two groups, double and single rods, showing that double rods had much better result in terms of curve correction and the spinal length with the same uh, similar uh, risk of complication. So give recommendation C in favor of using uh, magnetic rods for select, select the case of uh, pediatric scoliosis. And the recommendation B, uh, when you, whenever you decide to use magnetic rods, it's better to use the double rods because it has a, a good recommendation for that. This publication we produced in 2016. If there are any questions about the previous example, please feel free. I just unmute the microphone and ask it, please. So this is another uh, example, another situation in which we decided to do an uh, evidence-based study because we had one discussion on debate, what was the best treatment for one specific case in my hospital? This uh, was a young uh, Mirati gentleman who had a car accident, his, his car, with number one burst fracture with compression of his spinal cord. He was transferred to our hospital uh, for, the, as a, for the specific treatment of his uh, severe spinal trauma. He had the partial neurological damage on, on his uh, conus medullaris because has, uh, he had the uh, disturbance of the rectal sensory on that area and also uh, genital uh, dysfunction, especially with uh, neurogenic bladder. So as we know, the, this uh, basic rule for neuroanatomy, according to the spinal level, we have the, 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 sp the level of the spinal cord in this, inside the canal. For the spinal level one is the, sp the end of the spinal cord, so they call the, uh, the conimidularis, which includes the sacral coccygeal segment of the spinal cord. So it's compatible with his uh, fracture. It was lumbar one fracture, burst fracture. No need to, to give more details because not the goal. Now it's just to see how the EBM we use for this case. This is the Asia classification for this gentleman. So he had incomplete injury of his spinal cord, especially affecting his conus medullaris and uh, Asia grade D because he had this uh, dysfunction of his uh, anal contraction, voluntary anal contraction. So it's a typical case of condomidularis syndrome. So what to do? When he came to us, we uh, assessed the patient, we all, the whole team was involved on that, physiotherapy since the beginning and so on. We uh, request immediately one MRI to see the, the ligaments of his spine in order to use another more specific classification called TLIX, which is, which is the one has the best evidence to manage those cases, especially to guide us what the best treatment for this patient, at least if it's surgical or non-surgical treatment. Because using TLIX classification, if the patient has up to four points, not only, uh, I think this case needs surgery, we have to try to Avoid this as much as possible. According, for example, with TLIC classification, this patient has only two points, so it's conservative. 
or has four points, so it's doubtful. You can decide according to, uh, to the situation. But for five or more, it's basic surgical uh, case, for example. This patient, he had this uh, spinal burst fracture with injury of the ligaments as well. And this can uh, vertebral body, which give this patient the classification as at least seven points. So there is burst fracture with uh, partial neurological damage of the cones medullaris, three points, plus injury uh, of the ligament, at least suspicion of that, two points. So seven or eight if there is uh, confirmation of the injury, but was suspicion at least. So being five or more is already surgical case according to the classification. So uh, that was the diagnosis, is as Asia incomplete, seven point of clicks, we decided for the surgical treatment. We decided for surgery, we basically have to do the decompression of the spinal cord and the fixation for stabilization. But how to do? Anterior approach, posterior approach, or combined one? That was the main question in this case, and I will show how did you answer this. When you go to literature, there is some consensus, some expert opinion, some studies showing uh, some advices according to the situation of the historic lumbar fracture, what's the best, the best approach. But for a specific, this question, which is very important, which is patient neurologically incomplete, like this patient, with uh, uh, ligaments, it was intact, is one scenario, we're not sure. Looks like ligament was uh, disrupted, so. Is exactly in that case, it looks like neurologically incomplete, so had a partial injury of his spinal cord with possible uh, disruption of the ligaments. So it's evidence level five is a consensus of this spinal group publication. So uh, you can do anterior uh, decompression of the spinal cord and fixation, or even front and back approach. So basically this one suggestion based on this literature. I also like to use the O classification, it's very useful for such cases, but also there is no strong evidence, but this consensus is very helpful for those societies, but the evidence on the literature was not so strong on which technique was better. Uh, on my understanding, it makes sense because the fracture was in the front part, so it'd be easy to remove the front part of the, of the vertebral body to make an, the compression of the interior part for the spinal cord. So anterior stabilization also following the AO guidelines seems to be a good option, but not the only one. You see there are different options for the same uh, scenario. So imagine on the urgent, anywhere you are in any emergency, urgent uh, situation, what to do. So I decided to go for the anterior stabilization, which for me makes a lot of sense. We, we have to balance the pros and cons, of course. You can also go posterior, you're not considered wrong. Of course not both anterior or posterior approach, or if you combine the front and back, on this case, are considered uh, acceptable techniques. But I was not uh, really uh, convinced only with that. We need more scientific uh, uh, base to give you better guidance, at least for the next case. So uh, we decided to treat this patient surgically, Based on the available literature, we decided to go anteriorly or anterolateral approach using neuromonitoring to check the nerves during the surgery. Is uh, could it be open approach or MIS? I prefer to do open approach for a better decompression of the spinal cord. Perform the copectomy of uh, lumbar one. We open the 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 chest cavity. We remove part of the rib, which we use as a bone graft. It also helps for the exposure. So you can see there the lung, the diaphragm, uh, the, the, here we push the lung, exposing the aorta and the spine. So before the, we uh, ligate any vessel, we can use a neuromonitor to check if the vessel for the spinal cord is, a, is an important one, so if it can be ligated or not, for example. And then replace the vertebral body which was broken by some uh, instrumentation, for example. In this case, I use a combination of bone graft from a bone bank, the rib itself from the patient, plus a uh, cage and plate. So it was several layers. So here the cage, the rib, the cage, there's a bone graft inside, the rib graft from the patient, more uh, allograft and the plate besides to give a strong fixation for 
uh, after the colpectomy. The patient had a chest tube and they went for the ICU overnight. So uh, the patient had a relatively good recovery because after five days, he started to recover his bladder function, which was very good. So at the end of the week, he, he, moved, he changed from Asia D to Asia E. Very good recovery, at least neurologically. So we uh, discharged the patient for the follow-up. So the late follow-up, like almost one year after, the fixation was good and also on the stabilization was in good position. And the, the neurological recovery was uh, really fantastic in this case. So, but there are some colleagues also question me, why did you do such a big surgery anterior approach instead of doing posterior fixation? Well, I told my, my colleague, well, that's your option. You can do anterior posterior. But even though we're studying, uh, we make a systematic review about it to try to present on the next meeting, what is the evidence showing in this situation? So patient with this kind of fracture, with neurological deficits, what's the best surgery? Going from the front or from the back? Because until now, there's no uh, strong evidence for that. So we did this study, some colleagues here in Dubai, but most of the colleagues are very well known here. And uh, we did a systematic review. And amazingly, only three papers were published in the last 20 years uh, studying patients with neurological deaths and toric lumbar burst fracture. Only three papers, uh, comparative papers. So we decided to include only paper level one, two, three, only comparative papers. And we could show on this uh, review, although there is a limit of available papers uh, that you cannot change, but the, the motor score and this neurological score was much better on those patients submitted to the anterior approach, which was really uh, very important for the, the prognosis. Also, the vertebral height was uh, much better on the anterior approach. Uh, however, the surgical timing was shorter using posterior approach, and also the bleeding was uh, much less on the posterior approach. Uh, the complication rate was similar, uh, but was lower on the anterior approach as well, which is uh, really also very encouraging for me to continue on this uh, technique. So, those, this is the summary of those three papers showing uh, comparing anterior and posterior approach for similar uh, cases, showing different level of evidence. This paper is level three. And there's only one paper level one from China. It's amazing. China, they published such a very big series. They could compare randomized controlled study. They include 60, 60, patients in one group submit to the anterior approach, and they randomized six patients for posterior approach from the same clinical scenario, toric lumbar burst fracture with neurological deaths. So this paper was really amazing because it was very important to answer those questions. It was showing what you just said. Anterior approach is much better in terms of neurological recovery, but causes more bleeding and the surgical time is, is longer. But there are some studies showing that for the patient, the, the, the most important is the neurological recovery. So uh, in summary, when we published this paper, we could uh, conclude that comparing anterior and posterior approach for this kind of case, patient with neurological deficit, anterior approach has evidence level one, which is superior to posterior approach in terms of neurological recovery. But because it's a single level one study, so we cannot give the best recommendation, but the recommendation grade B which is suggested is a very good one as well. I hope more publication going to support this in favor or against to give us more information. This publication, uh, it was released last year. Show level one of evidence and recommendation B in favor of the anterior approach for neurological recovery in those cases. And finally, uh, one, and another example and the last example, showing how we can use also the evidence-based medicine to deal with some relatively new techniques, okay? Not only for our knowledge, for, for, to share the information with the patient, but also to prove the insurance uh, uh, doctors or, or colleagues there uh, to justify, based on the best available evidence recommendation, the procedure that you're suggesting for the patient. Uh, this is a case that we 
are doing this kind of surgery we are doing for since many years. We choose this, this is the use of cervical disc arthroplasty for cervical disc disease. I followed here the recommendation uh, from North American Spine Society as the main one in which they have what they call re uh, recommendation for the insurance. It's called the coverage policy recommendations based on the available literature. We can give for such situation what recommendation that the insurance should cover for those cases. The evidence is so strong that you can really, you should cover uh, this type of treatment for that specific indication. The very interesting uh, guidelines from NES. So uh, we know with, uh, that cervical radiculopathy and myelopathy are very important for the, for I mean, are very uh, serious uh, situation. We can drive the patient to the spinal surgeon which uh, recommends surgery in many, most of those cases, especially when there is persistent uh, uh, radiculopathy or myelopathy. Another interesting situation, uh, the evidence is stronger in favor of radiculopathy than myelopathy. What's the meaning of that? The, the, for me, the understanding that because there are not so many studies, again, comparing patient with myelopathy, because the patient has compression for the spinal cord, the indication for the surgery is almost uh, undoubtful. But for radiculopathy, you can uh, try different approach. This I, I'm talking about. I like it very much to use this coverage policy recommendation from NAS. There are different, um, about 20 uh, policy recommendations available on the NAS uh, uh, society, published by NAS, uh, North American Spine Society, for, to deal with those cases. There's one policy recommendation for cervical disc arthroplasty. Just for uh, general understanding, arthroplasty is the use when you remove the disc and the cervical spine, you can replace it by something fixed like bone graft, plate, or cage for fusion, in which you immobilize the segment, but on the long term, it can cause some problems, especially on the disc above and below. But a relatively new technique published around 22 years ago, but for the first time, is the use of artificial disc, in which you can replace the disc by one mobile core, which uh, try to copy the same uh, normal motion of the that cervical segment. The first publication was from Cummings in UK, uh, where when he and his uh, biomedical engineer, Mr. Walker, they developed this metallic artificial disc and they published the case series of 20 patients. So, uh, just refreshing his case series, new technique, very uh, good publication. It's a level evidence for because case series, his first 20 cases of cervicotoplasty published in the world. And he showed good results on this uh, initial study. So this same type of disc, uh, the same design was bought by Meritron company. We developed this Prestige LP, which is one of the most used nowadays for arthroplasty. So the rationale of cervical disc arthroplasty is to remove the, the degenerate or herniated disc, decompress the spinal cord and the root like the fusion technique, but instead of make a fixation, you replace the disc, preserve the motion using artificial disc in order to avoid the drawbacks of fusion, like increase the pressure on the disc above and below, problem of pseudoarthrosis, uh, with the implants and so on. So we follow the NAS uh, guidelines, the recommendation for cervical disc arthroplasty, this is very important. It does, as I said before, does not limit us, but give a good guidance in what is really has a strong evidence to suggest to the patient and to the insurers that the best approach for that case, or at least one good option. Patients with radiculopathy affect one or two levels, or myelopathy for one or two levels as well. Artificial disc is a good option. If you uh, don't, uh, of course, if you check uh, the selection, there is no contraindication that they're going to show on the next slide. Among the contraindication, the list is longer than fusion. There are more limitations. But in summary, artificial disc is good for younger patients around less than six years old in general. Why? Because the patient should not have osteoporosis and the, the joint, the disc should have a good height and not a very large osteophytes. Because if the patient has very large osteophytes, 
that you should, this is not going to work very well. And the, if you remove the osteophyte to implant their, their tissue disc, there's a high chance that this osteophyte can grow again and cause another neurological compression. So basic artificial disc is more recommended for those younger patients with soft disc herniation. Instead of fusion that you can use for in any case, artificial disc, there is this kind of limitation. But whenever possible is a very good technique. A typical case for arthroplasty in one young patient with soft uh, disc herniation. And uh, anterior severity approach is a classic approach. I prefer on the left side for an anatomical reason, but it's a surgeon preference. We use it to remove the anterior sulfite and the artificial disc. I use the loop initially, and then I go for the surgical microscope for the posterior remove the disc and the removal of the osteophyte. After that, we, uh, we size uh, precisely, we choose the, the size of the disc and we implant to replace the, the remove the disc. This one is tissue disc during implantation and after that. So this uh, actually show the tissue disc in one level. It's a good uh, motion preservation on that level and the resolution of the symptoms. So according to the current literature, arthroplasty is a very good technique for a selected case. If you, of course, only the, the patient we can fit for this technique for one or two levels. So there's advantage and disadvantage, of course. One of the advantage of the arthroplasty, as I said, is to avoid the problem of fusion, especially the non-fusion, the pseudarthrosis, so artificial disc, you don't have this problem of pseudoarthrosis. There, and very important, the risk of a subsequent surgery on the same level or adjacent one is less than half if you compare arthroplasty against fusion. Of course, any surgery has risks, but the risk is for those patients submit to arthroplasty is less than half for a reoperation. Because you preserve the motion, you avoid the uh, increased pressure on the disc above and below, that naturally you do it when you perform a fusion. But also there are some disadvantages. For example, artificial disc is more demanding. The decompression should be even more careful because any remaining osteophyte or, or remaining disc herniation can, uh, uh, can it will be there and the osteophyte can continue growing because the motion preservation can also promote this growing of the remaining osteophytes. So that's why if there are very, very large osteophytes, it's not a good idea to go for artificial disc. But small ones, fine, you can remove it, and uh, most likely not going to happen. But if it happens, sometime, most of the time when there is osteophytes, it's called heterotopic ossification, trying to close the disc space, most of the time is, uh, those patients are asymptomatic. But you have to explain it to the patient that there is one risk of arthroplasty. Despite of that, we show on the long-term studies that result in comparison with fusion is better. So uh, this one very classic study of Gornet and colleagues in US, in which they study 10 years already follow-up of a study level one of evidence. Actually, it's very important to highlight in this part. <laughs> there are many authors saying that arto cervical arthroplasty, one of the few topics in medicine in which there a lot of strong uh, uh, studies with strong evidence. There are many studies level one, which is not so common in spinal surgery, especially comparing arthroplasty and fusion. It's very interesting. There are many, many studies comparing those two techniques and practically all the studies show on the same direction with very, very minor uh, dif uh, differences. So this study of Gornet, initially we start to follow this, this approach I started to use Avtoplast in 2006 when I was still in Brazil. So I have 14 years experience. Of course, we get more mature, uh, technically speaking. We start to see the, the complications and the literature and start to, to, to realize what the, the most important aspect. In my opinion, it's still the most important uh, uh, thing to decide about Avtoplast and to perform it is the patient selection. If you select wrongly the patient, in one case, you should be better for fusion. You do arthroplasty, the chance of complication is a bit higher. But this study, for example, there are many studies, but this one of Gornet 
they, 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 they did many studies, did the longest follow-up, 10 years, but there is around nine or 10 studies with this uh, long follow-up already available from different places, showing the following. Here, comparing in blue, the arthroplastic uh, group, here the fusion group for one level, and showing that the arthroplastic group has better outcomes, neurological outcomes, general outcomes, and less complication in terms of uh, reoperation than fusion. Both techniques are considered a good one, but arthroplastic is even better. This study from the same group, uh, comparing two levels, arthroplastic against two levels fusion, also long-term follow-up, 10 years, they also show a very similar result, showing that arthroplasty is more advantageous in terms of neurological and clinical recovery, and, and even better for the, re reducing a lot the chance of reoperation. So just a summary of this study, the prospective RCT, so it's a level one study, the best evidence available, comparing two levels uh, patient with first vacuole disc disease, See, uh, art arthroplasty using prestige LP, one type of disc, against fusion with bone graft and plate. Uh, comparing 10 years, showing this evidence level one. Here showing the results. Arthroplasty is showing in red bar and the fusion on blue. So in most, all, all the outcomes, arthroplasty is better or similar. There is no outcome in which fusion is better than arthroplasty according to the available literature. And the, the, the most important for me, what really convinced me to do arthroplasty as much as possible whenever we can, whenever the patient also has, is a good candidate for that, is the risk of reoperation. Of course, any surgery can have a complication and need another operation. But the chance for reoperation on the arthroplasty group, you can see even on 10 years follow up is much less than on the fusion group. And uh, in summary, for uh, this study, uh, at le level one of evidence, the overall success compared arthroplasty and fusion is 80% for arthroplasty in favor of that against 62% for fusion group. Also, NADI and neurological success reoperation rate, all those parameters uh, were assessed here and showing that arthroplasty is no inferior statistically to fusion in every outcome and was superior to a CDF or fusion in many uh, outcomes. Uh, we are doing this study project, a multi center study, including my hospital, also NBI University. Uh, Merit Specialty Hospital, where Dr. Big also is uh, one of the authors. We are doing this prospective study nowadays here in Dubai since last five years, comparing all the patients with, uh, also including our uh, good friend here, Dr. Farah, who is the owner of the organizer of this meeting today, Dr. Big, Dr. Nicola, other colleagues, Dr. Raja, and Dr. Aida, professor of the MBIU, so a really a multi center study comparing those. Uh, uh, surgical uh, treatment for cervical disc disease. We're comparing arthroplasty against fusion and hybrid cervical surgery for uh, cervical spine loss. Hybrid surgery when you combine fusion one level, arthroplasty and another level. But you, you're doing like this very interesting study compared to those three uh, different techniques. We're aiming to achieve one study level two of evidence because it's not randomized, but it's a prospective comparative study. And nowadays, according to the latest result until last week, but still had to include a few more uh, cases from the other colleagues, we have uh, a, a rel relatively good result uh, among those 73 patients that we included here. There's only one case one, with patient of, with arthroplasty, which she, she developed one ossification very big behind the disc almost three years later which uh, forced us to remove the, the artificial disc because she started developing symptoms again three years later, and we made the fusion. And there was one case in which the arthroplasty was not enough. We had to perform posterior foraminotomy for better opening of the foramen, and the patient had great, great result. We, can, we could keep the artificial disc, but you had to complete the, the technique by posterior decompression as well. 
non fusion, we had in one case only symptomatic, but the symptoms are getting better, so no need to any reoperation on the fusion group. And we had one temporary uh, horn syndrome, one case of hybrid surgery, but uh, the patient completely recovery. So basically, only reoperation for heterotopsification and one for amnotomy in terms of surgical interventions afterwards. So uh, those different uh, techniques were compared, all different nationalities. The main one are the, from UK and those uh, different levels. So we compared the, the result in green, the pain before surgery among those patients and blue after surgery for neck pain, the results not so great as expected, but for the arm pain, the right arm green before blue after surgery, the result was much, much better uh, as also as expected because of the neurological decompression during the surgery. In summary, uh, arthroplasty, we can say that is an is as effective or even superior in many outcomes as fusion for the treatment of cervical disc disease for one or two levels. So I can say uh, uh, that there is very strong evidence, level one, based on multiple RCTs, randomized controlled studies, uh, stating the same uh, conclusion. We can give us recommendation grade A in favor of arthroplasty. So just to conclude our presentation, then you go for the, the questions, please. Uh, EBM in, in spinal surgery, in, med, in medicine in general, is really very important to be used as much as possible to guide ourselves what the best treatment for our patient, uh, how, to sh uh, how to explain to the patient which technique is better, and also in some cases to convince the insurance uh, to approve that technique based on the, on the medical evidence. Just remi to re remind one more time, evidence level one are those studies, the articles which are randomized controlled studies, which we can randomize the, the groups in two groups and compare uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the result of those groups. Level two are those studies where you have a prospective one, like the, the one that you are doing here in Dubai, uh, comparing the study, but not to randomize these patients. Level three, we compare retrospectively the case of one group, one specific medicine, another group, a different drug or only a placebo, for example. Level four, case series, which is very useful for new, new techniques or new treatments, new medicines. And level five is your opinion or one uh, society consensus. So there is some value, but you have to be aware that there is no strong evidence in favor or against one specific intervention. Based on this level of evidence, then we can give uh, consciously what the recommendation grade. Grade one A is the best one. You can recommend that specific intervention or even in favor or against, you can say that specific medicine is not good based on uh, the multiple studies level one of evidence. So can give recommendation grade A saying that one specific medicine is not good at all uh, uh, until the, uh, according to the current uh, available literature. Or if you only have, have one single level one study, like that publication about thoracic trauma, or multiple level two or three in favor or against one specific intervention, so we have a suggested recommendation. So it seems to be really good, but not exceptional. So. It, it may still, uh, uh, this approach may still change according to the case, according to the, the new paper that are coming on the next few years, for example. When there has uh, only single level two, so only perspective, no, no randomized studies, or multiple study level four or five, you can give uh, as accommodation as an option. For example, the case for mag magnetic rods, it was considered an option, but if you use the common sense, it really seems to be very reasonable because you avoid many surgeries, but still there are not strong studies to show that. Like the case of the treatment of the spinal uh, tumor, which seems to be a good option to use the radiotherapy after surgery to prevent or to minimize the chance of recurrence of the tumor as another example. So when there is only uh, one level two or multiple, multiple case series, for example, like for those uh, rare uh, diseases that have the case series, so you give an option 
as a, uh, the treatment as the answer for that question. But when you have less than that, you cannot say that one specific treatment, for example, the use of uh, one new laser uh, uh, machine for the treatment of herniated disc. Okay, there is no strong evidence to suggest that. I'm not saying that's not good, but nowadays there is insufficient evidence in favor of that technique or of that medicine for another disease. Maybe in the future it will come, but you have to be uh, careful about it. Uh, and to conclude this, uh, we have to be aware that we always have to use our clinical expertise, our knowledge, our experience in combination with the available evidence and the patient expectation for the best treatment of that. And please, let's try to use the science as much as possible to give the patient the best chance that he can have it based on the uh, available literature. Thank you very much. Questions? Dr. Farah, any colleague? Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Dr. Abdul Rashid, uh, radiology resident in hi, hi. Kenya, Nairobi. Oh. Uh, uh, I, 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 is, is, uh, Sana. Okay. Uh, this is really a great talk, uh, and, and it is a great honor for us to be with us and extend your experience to that far Somalia. Really, we, we are very uh, grateful and appreciate. So it was a really, really great honor, a really, really yeah. pleasure, and I hope I can continue on this channel with you guys. Yes, yes, that is what we appreciate. Thank you so much. And Dr. Farah, who organized the meeting with you. Uh, I had a question of like in Somalia, uh, the level of technology and consultants are not that much. Uh, there are old uh, procedures, especially in the orthopedic uh, procedures. Like for example, if uh, there is a uh, fracture in the, in, the, in the femur, they do the old procedure of traction, for example. Mm. Uh, there are no uh, modern technologies like MRI available in the country. The people are very poor people. So um, based on these evidence levels, uh, I think uh, there are some doctors who are uh, who are there a long time, but are not that updated. Uh, they use their experience uh, uh, based on their opinion. Uh, there are some young uh, doctors now did some uh, specialization like uh, masters or uh, or a PhD and back to the country. So when it comes to the level of uh, evidence-based medicine. Uh, some consultants who were there in the field long time still uh, may argue that they have an experience and they can do this procedure with a successful uh, outcome. So it, it is like level five. So uh, mm -hmm. how far can I trust the experience of those consultants? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good uh, point, actually. Uh, even nowadays, uh, like last year, I presented one lecture about use of artificial disc. No, actually, two years ago. After my lecture, I spent like uh, more than half an hour explaining all the evidence. I'm not trying to say that what, what I'm presenting, what I'm doing is the only solution. Of course not. But at the end of yeah. one of the presentation, one uh, of the consultant which was there on the audience, just stand up, okay, thanks, Nick, blah, blah. And yeah, but uh, I don't like it to pass. I don't like fusion. Okay, on, on the microphone, by the way. So uh, it, it's fine, but uh, it's not a matter of like or dislike. Of course, you prefer because of your experience, I respect that. But you have to be aware that even there's some techniques that I don't do it, I have to be aware that, okay, maybe that's a very good option. Not uh, That's considered as an, uh, one, a new technology whenever available, whenever I have the chance to do it. At least open this, this opportunity. And one of those situations that I present uh, today, at the end of my presentation, another case of the thoracic trauma, another colleague said, okay, but I, I'll go posteriorly. All right, it's fine. It's your choice. But I just showed, uh, not my opinion only, but, because my opinion is level five, but the literature was level one of evidence showing that for the best chance of neurological recovery, 
if you make a decompression from removing the vertebral body, decompress the spinal cord anteriorly, according to literature, not only my opinion, uh, it, it's better for, you have a better chance of neurological recovery. Can you have the same uh, uh, result doing posteriorly? For sure you can have it, but you, you have to be based on the, on the science, on the evidence. The chance is better anteriorly if possible. Oh, but in my place, in my hospital, you don't have these instruments. Okay, it's great, it's fine. What can you do? When I remember I was still uh, a young resident in my place in Brasilia, in Brazil, one of my uh, senior residents, I, I still remember that. And my first year of residency, he told me, Nick, doesn't matter whatever we, don't, we have or we don't have it here in your hospital. It was the governmental hospital in Brasilia. It was in 90, my goodness, 93. And uh, there was no MRI inside the hospital at that time. I said, Nick, think about science. Uh, okay, this patient with this clinic scenario request this, this needed this test, that, 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 right? Everything that he needs for legal reasons, the patient needs these things, okay? According to the available literature. Okay, but the hospital cannot provide those. Okay, that's another story. That's for the management to try to solve it. But if you don't know what is needed, if you don't request, if you don't push the people to move forward, on the direction of this new approach, which are really useful, not because the only is new. Also, there is another side of the story. Some people like to do anything that is new because it's new. No, it's not the point, which is new. And there is a good or a strong recommendation in favor of that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my, my, my understanding. I always tell my students, don't, don't think short. Well, for this case, okay, we have this uh, study only in Johns Hopkins. Okay, we need this study. Not available. Okay, no, so let's go for plan B, C, and D, whatever we can. But think, think uh, 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 whatever is needed, and uh, let's try to push for that. Please, uh, any any question, any comments? Mm, thank you, thank you, so much. Uh, uh, thank you. Dr. Farah, any other colleague, any comment? Someone, some colleagues are uh, writing uh, write on the screen some questions. Okay, he's saying thanks. If I yeah. have a if I have a case procedure with uh -huh. minimal with minimal source of evidence based, but some senior consult advice at the Felix X O. The same question I'm just asking to you. I think it's the same. You have answered already the question. That question. Yeah, uh, that's the thing. When we yeah. cannot. Yeah. Uh, yes, please go ahead. It was me who was done. Okay. Yeah, okay, he already answered that question. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's the point. Of course, the, the senior guys with your host when you come back from residency or from the fellowship, we cannot just go there and say, no, I'm the only one who is right here. Of course not. The experience also counts. I'm not saying that doesn't count. Remember that the EBM is a tripod. Doctor experience, literature, uh, available literature, and the patient values, what the patient expects with that treatment. As I said before, some patients come with back pain, and uh, one small disc protrusion, and they want to come for surgery, say, no, la, 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 not a good idea. Come on, the uh, small disc protrusion with low back pain, the result of the surgery is very poor, according to the current literature, for, for example. So uh, we have to be aware about what the patient wants to, to, uh, to achieve, and what the, uh, the literature says, and what you, you think you can do, what you think is the best option, according to your experience. All these three aspects. Any, any comments, any questions? If there's no other question, I think we can conclude. And the lecture has been recorded and it's be available upon your request. Yeah, yeah, thanks for reminding me. I will record this and I will put it on my uh, YouTube channel, which is only my name, Nicandro Figueredo. Uh, you can, in like in one or two hours, you can also uh, have the access for this whole presentation. Uh, as Dr. Farah is there, I'm very grateful that he had this initiative of organizing this kind of uh, meetings uh, involving different institutions in different continents, even here in the Asia, Africa, uh, South America, and Brazil, to join and the knowledge, have the chance to discuss. And I hope the more meetings are coming with other presenters, other topics to cover different areas. Thanks a lot for the audience. No, no other, okay, thanks a lot. Any other concern can also contact me by email and I will uh, publish this video on YouTube tonight. Thanks a lot. Ma salama. Ma salama. Thank you.